Okay, so I want you to just in your imagination, in your memory, in your history, I want you to think for a second, in this moment in time, are you more zealously sure that Jesus is returning soon than you were, let's say, in the last two years, in the last five years, in the last 10 years? Does it make more sense to you that Jesus is returning now than it did when Lighthop first started or when you first got in contact with end times teaching, like in a pronounced way in this season? Yes. Everybody says yes? Raise your hand. Everybody says yes. Do you feel as impatient about Jesus returning as you did in those early days? No. Did you feel impatient back then? What do you think made you feel impatient back then? This understanding. Misunderstanding. What do you, what do you think specifically, if you had to be like, okay, I, when I first heard this, I was like, it's on. Everybody I know needs to get this. Why hasn't anybody told me this? Why, what was the misunderstanding that made you feel impatient? Wanting everyone else to know it? Good. There's, there could be more than one. Samantha Stoltz says that it would be dr- super dramatic and super obvious, even though she lived with me, and I kept saying it's going to get harder to see as time goes on. I'm joking. What, what do you think was the misunderstanding that made you feel impatient at the very beginning? You were impatient that it'd be further away, like that you wanted it to take a little longer. It seems scary. Okay. Like the Shulamite. Yes, I will go with you on the high hills. Go away for now. Come back when the day breaks. Okay, good. Anything else? Gotcha. Gotcha. So Noah was feeling impatient just about everybody else getting it, and feeling like he got it, but he was impatient that everybody else get it. Is that, did I characterize that right? No. <laughs> oh, he was ready. So, okay, I'm impatient for you to come. He wasn't really thinking about the rest of the world. Gotcha. Okay, good. I'm glad that I clarified that. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about redeeming the time. One of the main themes in the book of Ephesians is actually time. And so if you don't know to look for it, you might miss it. You might, it might just get blended in with all of the the beautiful language of Ephesians or all of the admonitions of what to do. But you have to understand that it's all about time because love is actually found in the, your, your response to time is what determines whether or not you're loving or not. And this is, It might be a a new idea for you, but once you see it, you can't unsee it. Everybody wants to be loving. Like, even some of the the, people that have done the most heinous things on the planet, they really thought that they were doing the right thing or the good thing or the most loving. You know, it's like the Thanos in Infinity War, Avengers Infinity War. And they're like, you know, you think you're the you, you think you see the thing or you can do the thing. And he's like, I'm the only one who sees it. Like... There's this idea that is about impatience in time that if we don't find the time that Jesus is talking about, even though our intentions are great, we will impatiently not love people and do the exact wrong thing at the exact right time. Okay? So this is all about time. Now, I had a message. I feel like the Lord wants me to be candid with you. I had an entire message written out. Before I woke up this morning, I had notes, like tons of notes. I had like eight pages of things that I wanted to say to you, and he scrapped it all, and he said, I want you to say this, and he showed it to me so supernaturally, I know I have the word of the Lord for you. I know it. So if you want to be teachable, then you will receive something. I don't know what you'll receive. I don't know exactly what he'll say to you, but if you don't, if you want to be right, you won't receive anything this morning. So right now, I want to be teachable. Like, I had an entirely different idea this morning, what I wanted to talk about, what I felt like the Lord wanted me to talk about. It. He's been working it out in my heart. I've been writing about it all week. But he's actually like, Tom, I want you to be teachable right this second, okay? So I just want to 
approach this information with this. So item one, redeeming the time. Now this is about, obviously about Ephesians, but I would take it as like a, a footnote. Like if you're reading something and there's like, oh, that word's interesting. The footnote is, this is a footnote. If he, he wants us to read Ephesians. If you want to be a part of what I feel like he's saying, read Ephesians for yourself. Read it with this in mind, okay? Redeeming the time. We are living in the relationships, faith, and the environment that we prayed for in past seasons. Does everybody here love the environment you're living in right now? Like in your family, in your church, in the city, at your job? Do you love the environment that you're living in right now? Be honest. You don't, Sam. I know you're kind of like, I, I kind of do, but there's lots of things about our environment that you don't love, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Somebody said something? Both. And I think that's what Sam was probably saying was both. But it's important to recognize there are some things we could have prayed for last year that would make a lot of the things we see as problems right now not problems. And it's not everybody else's fault. It's actually our fault. Because he actually was telling us to pray for some things that we neglected. He was showing us some things he wanted to give us that we lack right now. And this will be true until we're face-to-face -face with him and we become the thing that we don't know what we're going to be, but we know we'll be like him. There are some things that God, he actually wants us to be like, okay, I'm lacking this thing because I really haven't taken seriously that I need it. I thought, yeah, it's a good thing to have. Yeah, I'll get to that eventually. But I don't really see that everything's on the line. Next year is going to be much harder than this year relationally. I want to tell you this for sure. Next year is going to be much harder relationally. It's going to be harder at work. It's going to be harder with money. It's going to be harder with your family. It's going to be harder between Sam and I. Because God is testing all things to find faith. He's testing all things to find, do I really love him more than any of the things that are here on earth? And do I really trust him with all the things I'd be tempted to worry about on earth? Do I really trust him? Because he wants to qualify me into heaven. He wants to qualify you into heaven. So right now we're living in the relationships, the faith, the environment that we prayed for in past seasons. And that is a hopeful thing because it could be much, much worse. You prayed for some things that you're not... Do you know people that are dealing with stuff you're not dealing with? Do you know people that are confused that you're not confused? Do you know like, oh my word, I see something hopeful in this that the world doesn't see. That's because you've been praying into it. You're no different than the rest of the world. You weren't born like the good one and everybody else is a dummy and God found you and he's like, okay, let's do something with you. We're only righteous because he's righteous. We're only righteous because we believe something that he told us. We believe something he thought about us. That's it, okay? This is so important. Our experience of time right now is some expression of what we prayed for then. And then the same will be true next week, next month, next year, next millennia. We can change. Now, you're not fully an expression of somebody who knows Jesus is coming back. I want to tell you, I know you. You're not fully the expression of that. Neither am I. But I need to be more of the expression of somebody who knows Jesus is coming back next year, next week, tomorrow. Because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know. What, I mean, when COVID happened, it, it, it revealed so many things that we were thinking wrong. So many things. And it's, it was global. It wasn't just us, right? So Ephesians 5, 14 to 16. Therefore, he says, now he says this to the church. He says this to people that Paul calls faithful in Ephesians 1. Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspect, circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. The days are evil. It's very tempting to want to save something from what's going on right now, but God would say the days are evil. If you want to save this life, you're actually cooperating with evil. The trajectory of the entire world, the entire planet, your family, your heart, without him pulling you out of the world, the trajectory of your life is to hell. The trajectory of this planet is to fire. This, these days are evil. There's not like some stuff worth saving. It's just he's so patient. He waits for us to see, oh, my family could actually never work apart from me being wholeheartedly on fire, in love, leave the world, go to heaven with Jesus. My, my work would never actually work long-term this way. My church, it cannot work without me zealously being like, okay, God, I'm coming out of the earth and into you forever. It's just he's so patient, we can tend to see a little bit of the growth of connecting to Jesus and then try to keep that thing and be like, okay, this is good. We'll keep this, Jesus. Let's keep this growing. But that's not what he wants to do. He wants to keep us going to him. 
Keep us coming near to him. Not taking something that he's given us and being like, okay, this is our vineyard now. Let's get it to bear some fruit. Because if you do that, what happens is he sends his son, and he's like, give me the harvest. And we're like, no, it's our harvest. There's parables in the Bible about this. This is what the Pharisees fell into. The Pharisees fell into the kingdom of their own making. They took the things God had given them, and they made their own kingdom out of it. And then when the owner of the vineyard came, they, tried, they killed his son. That's what the parable is about. In fact, it says that they knew he was talking about them when he told that parable. But the same will be said of us if we try to keep the things that he's given us. We're not supposed to keep the things he's given us. This is the story of faith all the way back to Abraham taking Isaac up on Mount Moriah. When he gives us something, we give it back to him, and he gives it to us more. That's always going to be the case. So right now, if you can recognize the time, you'll let go of the things that you'd be tempted to save on the earth. A lot of the misunderstanding, at least my anecdotal observation teaching the end times for over 10 years, is that most people, when they hear about the end times, they start thinking about what it's going to what it's going to cost them on the earth. That reveals something. That reveals what's really in our hearts, if we can be honest about it, if we can embrace the fact that we live mostly here. And the entire point of the end times is to get us off of the planet into the heavenly realm, okay? Ephesians 1, verse 10. Now, the heavens are coming down to the earth. But the problem with that, if you don't respond to the coming out of the world and into the kingdom of God, is that when the heavens come down, they will crush everything that rebels against him. And you, are, you were born rebelling against the kingdom. You were actually born with a rebellious heart, believe it or not. Ephesians 1.10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, everybody say times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth in him. Ephesians 1, 13 to 18. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the, uh, with the seal of, of the Holy Spirit of promise. That means when you first believed, believed what? That Jesus was your Savior. That's usually the introduction for most people believing. But you're actually supposed to be believing more. You're supposed to be knowing Jesus and believing in him more and more and more over time. It's a relationship of, of getting to know him. So every time you believe, you get sealed with the seal of promise again. Every time you see something new, you get sealed with the seal of promise to keep you, to hold you in what's called patience as the return of Yeshua unfolds, as the revelation of Yeshua unfolds. Now, when you read about the re re revelation of Jesus, or the return of Jesus, are you reading just about Jesus who sits on the throne next to the Father? No, you're reading about his body as well. He's being revealed in the book of Revelation, not just when he comes from the heavens. He's joining everything in heaven and earth together in one in Christ. So when you think about the revelation of Jesus, you're supposed to also be thinking about the revelation of his bride, the beauty of what's supposed to be coming forward right now, not in everybody around you, not like Noah's thinking, you know, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready for you. I'm beautiful before you. No, we should actually be concerned that people aren't ready to meet him. It should actually break our hearts the way that we've helped people be unready to meet him the way that we have actually shunned people that needed him, like written them off, hardened our heart, kind of pushed them aside, shunned people that needed him instead of being like, let's get closer. We need him. You're actually part of my body. When you ache, I ache. When one part suffers, we all suffer, is the way that Paul says it in Corinthians. Do you see what I'm saying? So we have to understand that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, when he gathers everything together, there's going to be a lot of tears. There's gonna, because people didn't know the time because they didn't love they put it off. They were indifferent. They were like, I could love later. You see what I'm saying? You ever thought that? I got to learn how to love. I got to learn how to love. Someday, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop being so self-concerned, so ashamed, so prideful, and I'm going to get victory over this. And he would say, today's the day. Today's the day. You're seeing the time wrong. You're thinking you've got more time to work out your salvation than you really do. Now, what I'm describing, believe it or not, is patience, not impatience. Okay? Stay with me for just a minute. In him also you trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until, everybody say until. That's a time statement. The redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Whose glory gets praised when you get redeemed? Jesus. 
Jesus' glory will get praised when you get redeemed. You're working that out right now. You're getting ready to actually be glad when Jesus gets glory when you get redeemed and not you. But when you right now get sealed with the seal of promise, when he gives you a word of knowledge, when he gives you an ability to do something, when he gives you an opportunity to speak, you're mostly thinking about, will I be rejected or will I be glorified in that? That's where everybody starts. But we're going to, will I get across to be like him? Will he get the glory? Like, if I really do the thing I'm anointed to do, will people reject me, misunderstand me, try to kill me? Will the world hate me, but I'll learn how to love them? That's where that glory is. is I, will I learn how to love them even when they reject me, hate me, resist me, persecute me? Will he get the glory? Will his testimony on the cross get the glory? Or am I just glad for an opportunity to have a little bit more of the vineyard so people will see I'm a righteous person? And I want to give you the answer. It's B for everyone until they get into the place where it's A. It's a B for everybody, okay? There weren't some people that were born like, I just give the glory to God. No one was born that way. If that happened, if that was possible, Jesus wouldn't have gone to a cross. He would have taken that one person, and they would have built a kingdom together. But that's impossible. There's no man that was born able to give God the glory. We just trick ourselves into thinking it because our intention is to give God the glory. But that's different than actually giving him the secret, cellular thought depth of your heart to glorify God and not yourself, Okay? This is, this is like sharp two-edged sword where the spirit meets the soul kind of stuff. So this is what Paul says. Because this is true, but I just told you it's true. He says, I pray. Because this is true, I pray. Okay, so he says, therefore. What's the therefore? I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, he says, I know you signed up for the death of your flesh. I heard that you guys signed up for the death of your flesh. I pray. It's going to take prayer. It's not like you're some good gem that just needs to be polished up and uncovered. You need to be killed and resurrected like Jesus. That's hard. That's very hard, okay? So he says, I pray, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So this is the question. You believe Jesus is coming more now now than you ever did before. You're feeling more patient. Do you love the people that you pursue Jesus with more than you ever have before? Is it easy to just flow together, get along, believe in each other, have hope? And I don't want anybody to answer because you're going to answer either a lie or the truth, and it will hurt your heart either way. The truth is, no, you don't, because you have seen something about people that has disappointed you in this process according to the Bible. And Paul says, I know you signed up for the death of your flesh to get ready for him in faith, He says, so I don't stop praying for you, that you would actually get something from heaven that would help you do this thing on the earth. Because we tend to think, if we do this thing on the earth, we'll be a help to heaven. And he's like, no. If you're going to do this thing on the earth, great, count the cost. You have to actually get something from heaven just to stay in love as you work this out with people. Because everybody's trying to work out the same thing, which is, I've got this thing called the flesh and this sin. It's not me, actually, that sins. It's my flesh that's sinning, but I can't separate myself from my flesh. That would make you self-righteous if you could. Instead, I have to be in this process of Jesus not violating my free will while I tell him all the things I need, and that's messy and ugly and hurts. It's pain. Do you get what I'm saying? And that's what you signed up for. So Paul's like, I can see from this perspective where I'm at in the heavens with Jesus That when you said you want to come up here where I am, it's not all fun and roses up here. I went to the third heaven, yes. I can't even tell you about it. But I want to tell you, you need something to do this. You need something to do this. And that's good. We don't need to be ashamed that we need something to do. We need to be open to receive it, okay? So he says, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, or he says, I don't cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father glory, may give you the spirit of, what do you need? Wisdom and revelation of what? Him. In the knowledge of him. Why did Jesus love his enemies? Why did he not stop the crucifixion? Why did Jesus not go and save Lazarus right away, even though everyone would think he was evil? Because he could. Why did Je- what is the knowledge of Jesus really about? Isn't it about the way that he loved people that hated him? 
And if you do all these things, if you grow in your belief that he is returning, if you do all the service, if you stay in the race, you stay in the game, you come to the meetings, but you don't grow in love, it's waste according to everything in the Bible. Everything in the Bible. The only point of all this is to become more like Jesus, friend of sinners, lover of enemies, on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Looking at the thief and saying, you're coming with me today. That thief was part of the people that hated him. Part of the people that were killing him. His best friend was like, save us if you're God. But the thief on the cross was like, I deserve this. Do you deserve a cross? Yes, you do. And I want to tell you, everyone's going to get one. It's just, do you want it now while he helps you with it? Or do you want the punishment for your sin later? Which one do you want? I want the one where he helps me with it. I want the one where he gets the glory for it. Do you know he's going to preside over hell forever? There's no place that's not under Jesus' control. It says he's going to, the smoke of their torment, it rises up before him. The people that are burning in hell forever with the mark of the beast, the smoke of their torment rises up before Yeshua forever. He's going to, he's going to ex- examine and witness your presence forever, one way or the other. I want, when it happens, I want him to be like, oh, the aroma of death on you is life to me. It's life to me. You were willing to die with me. You were willing to believe me on the front end. You saw the time. You saw how little time you had to actually pick this. This might be your last day. This might be your last day to get free of your offense, get free of your hardened heart, get free of your self-defenses, your self-protection. This might be the very last day. If you saw the time right, every day would live that way. Do you see what I'm saying? Jesus lived this way. He lived completely free of offense and, and all of the shame. He just lived connected to God in the heavens, knowing the time. And this is what God wants for us. So love is a time problem. Okay, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened so that the wisdom and revelation is what we need. That the eyes of our understanding, that means your spiritual understanding of everything that's happening around you, be filled with light that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So the reason that we come here, the reason that we pray, it's, yes, so that we would become more like him, more sanctified. That's good. It's actually because our friends would become more sanctified and more like him as well. Not wanting or willing them to, but just being concerned that there's a place for them to do the very same thing. It's it's kind of what Noah was saying, the very same thing that we know works for us. And so that means, oh, I'm going to actually do that with people. They're going to find bumpy spots in their heart, just like I find bumpy spots in my heart. And so when that happens, I'm going to say, this is working. It's working when we're all finding these bumpy spots in our heart together, because it's about his inheritance in the saints, right? It's not about coming and everything being smooth and feeling like, hey, this is where it's really working. Like, I'm not finding any bumpy spots. It's like, sweet. If you're not finding bumpy spots when all of creation is being pressed under the hand of God, you've got a problem. We should all be finding bumpy spots. And we should be finding them in each other and then loving each other in those bumpy spots. And love means something specific. It means being open. It means being connected. It means being vulnerable. It means counting it all loss because Jesus, is, his inheritance is worth it to stay soft. It's worth it. So love is a time problem because righteousness and wickedness are both time problems. Righteousness and wickedness are both time problems. I'm going to say that one more time because I feel like the Holy Spirit's saying, say it again because you just got lost in the words. Righteousness and wickedness, they're not people problems. They're not doctrine problems. They're time problems. Now, you can have doctrine problems. You can have people problems. But according to the Bible, righteousness and wickedness is a time problem. Okay? And I want to prove this to you. Matthew 24, 43. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched. What he's saying is, every, if, if Jesus, if you knew for sure Jesus was coming tonight, your day would look way different. You might not even be here. If you knew for sure Jesus was coming tonight, you might be out making apologies to a bunch of people that you've offended and wronged. If you knew for sure you had about eight hours until Jesus came back, you'd carry your heart way different. All of us would, right? And everybody who's about to die, you ever seen anybody on their deathbed? They're like, they're really serious about the things that they did wrong and the things that they really want to make right before they meet him. 
We have to understand we have a time problem. And, and what Jesus said is, if the master, the guy who's going to fail at the problem, would have known the time I was coming, he would have watched. If you knew the time Jesus was coming, you won't fail. If you don't know, you will fail. Your intentions don't matter. What matters is your humility, your willingness to say, okay, he says it, I'm going to believe it, okay? Know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is faithful, the faithful and wise servant, is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler? Now, you could just read, who's going to take part in the first resurrection? Who's going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years? That's what he's saying, okay? Whose master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. That servant was like, it's on, today's the day. This is the last day. This is the last hour. All the writers of the New Testament said the exact same thing. I don't even get married. Paul's like, I don't even get married because I think it's so soon. If you do get married, you should act like one who has no wife because it's that soon. Now, when Paul said that, he said that by the Spirit in the confidence that if you actually live this way, you'd be a better husband than you could ever be living the other way. Because you, all of the getting ready is about how you treat other people. So when Paul says, that if you're married, you should live as the one who's unmarried because he's so close to coming. What he's saying is get even more sanctified in your marriage than you were being lazy, lackadaisical thinking you had more time. All your closest relationships are the one that know your failure the best, okay? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. Thank you, Lord. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. If that evil servant doesn't even say it to anybody else, just thinks, I don't know. Maybe it's a little longer. This is the start of wickedness right here. This was Adam and Eve's start of wickedness. I don't know. Maybe he's going to delay making us like him. He said we're made in his image. I don't feel it. I feel like a little baby that should be a God. And that's where all the rebellion came from. Just this little thought, I don't know. Maybe he's not what I thought. Maybe he's not like I think he's going to. I find myself asking him, are you coming, Lord? Are you coming? I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to put the business on hold again. I'm going to do the weirdest thing. I'm explaining it to people that I feel embarrassed to explain it to them. Are you really going to be coming in 2024? Because I believe this. I believe he's coming in 2024. I like to believe it. Now, I, I think it's probably wrong. But I like to believe it because it helps me do hard things. And what he said to me this morning was, does it matter? Would you obey me if I wasn't? Does it matter? I'm like, yeah, it does. And that's a problem. Because I don't know, today might be my last day. Today might be your last day. I want to meet him faithful. Do you want to meet him faithful? Raise your hands. Holy Spirit, make us faithful. We want to be awake. God, we want to love. Let us see these bumpy things that are happening in our lives as opportunities to be unguarded, open, helpful, witnesses of the way you carried your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessed is that servant who is master when he comes will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you, he'll make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come. Will is a very strong term will come on a day when he is not looking for him. Do you know that if you, in your mind, waver on this, if you're double-minded, if you're like the ways of the sea, you're like, I don't know, he will come like a thief to you. It's guaranteed. I mean, I could point you to actually probably about 10 passages where he promises, I will make a point of you not knowing. I will make a point that this thing hits you like a wave you weren't looking for, and you will be found unlovely, unloving. Now, this is, this is very complex, though. This isn't the end of anyone's story. If you're alive, when he comes and he finds you unloving, you will continue to live just as you are right now. You will live in a bonus round of a thousand years of this, of working it out, distant from him, much more distant than you had to be. He'll still have his spirit. He will still give his spirit generously, but you will have pain in your heart. You will have wished for a long time. You will spend your time wishing that you had believed him all the things that he said in the Bible. You will wish that you had believed it was the last hour. I guarantee it. It, it. The Bible makes it clear. You will wish. It's just you live in a culture that is so self-centered, takes everything on its own terms, does what it wants with the information, and then lives its life 
We live in a culture very much like the one Jesus came to the first time. Very much. Oppressed. Upset about the oppression. But unwilling to recognize the Messiah in his way of living that was way different than what they were oppressed by. We have to recognize Jesus, he is not like us. We could be like him, though. We could be like him. The master of the servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him in an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him into and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. You can read second death, second resurrection. Like, unless that person repents, then the final judgment of works of the last days, he will fail. And many people will be very offended with the way Jesus does this. It says that when he lets the snake back into the garden at the end of the millennial reign, a number as the grains of sand on the seashore will rebel against Jesus in that one last rebellion, even though there's been no devil on the planet for a thousand years. Even though there's been no demons lying to anyone. There's just arrogance in the human heart to say, I want life on my terms. That's all there is. So if you don't come out of it, that's all you got. That's what you get. And he says it will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it's very tempting to think, I'm willing to, I'm willing to do everything for him, but I'm also not going to waste this life. And if you do that, you're called double-minded. You're called lukewarm. You actually have to try to spend this life on him all the way. It's required. Matthew 13, 33 to 37. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It's like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and each to his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you don't know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Now, the evil servants, they don't want to be evil. Evil servants don't want to be evil. I'm going to say that one more time. Evil servants aren't trying to be evil. They want God just like you do. You might be one of them. The good servants, they're no better than the wicked servants. They just believe something different. They have the same desire. They're just open to changing because they see the time. Do you see what I'm saying? The righteous servants aren't, are righteous because they live like the master is returning any moment. The evil servants, they don't want to be evil. They simply doubt the timing of the master's return. I'm describing you. You might not think I am, but I am. I'm describing me. And I might not think I am, but Jesus said it to me this morning. And the Bible says it, so I'm going to believe it. I'm going to actually adopt this and say, Jesus, I don't believe you're returning like I need to. Like I need to for what's coming next. Now, if I'm living in today, if I'm actually living in tomorrow's worry, right, but not today's obedience, then I'll think to myself, I gotta, I'm going to work that out over time. That's going to be okay over time. But if I'm living in today's obedience and not borrowing tomorrow's worry, then I'm like, man, I got another day to fully embrace my need of a Savior, to fully embrace that I want to handle relationships differently. I want to walk into rooms open. I want to walk into conversations open. The, the cookout on Friday night, these are some of my least favorite things. Because I feel like I don't know what to say. I feel like it's going to be an awkward conversation. I might get sucked into a conversation that, you know, is difficult. Or, and for the last several months, God has been saying, before you walk into any gathering of people, say to me, I want my heart to be open. I want to take the low place. I want to listen. And I want to be a part. I want to be engaged in the body of Christ. This is helping me tremendously. It's helping me a lot. I would encourage you to read Ephesians with this in mind. Is this what the book of Ephesians is talking about? Like the way I go to meetings and like, interact with people and it is it's talking about being in a position in the heavenlies that when you interact on the earth you're bringing something down into the interaction not that when you're lateral on the earth interacting with people you're closing off and trying to actually save your own life we save our lives in a bunch of crazy little ways okay now both the wicked and the righteous have the same desire one is worked out in patience and faith and the other is worked out in impatience and doubt this is the story of Adam and Eve and every other person that we would read about winning or losing in the Bible. The righteous is no more righteous than the wicked, and the wicked is no less desiring to be good than the righteous. It's all about faith. It's all about faith. Connection to God in faith in the context of urgency. That's what patience is. I'm going to say that one more time. Connection to God in faith in the context of urgency. Do you think when you think of patience, do you think of urgency? You usually would probably in your flesh think of that as impatience. But the reason it's patience is it's urgency without eyesight. It's like, oh, 
I can be like as zealous as I can today, and I don't have to worry what that means. I don't have to worry. It's, it's you're, you're predestined to be righteous when he finds you if you're giving the other servants the proper food today. You see what I'm saying? But it's, it's, it's this eagerness, this is a zeal and this urgency that it has to be today. Today has to be lived fully in him. Today I need victory over my doubt. Today I need dis- victory over my discouragement. I don't want to waste today. I'm patiently waiting for my Lord. Do you see what I'm saying? If you're impatiently waiting for your Lord, you're like, he's delaying his coming. I can do whatever I want today. I can be lazy with my emotions today. I can, that's impatience. Do you see what I'm saying? The flesh says that's patience. Like, don't get too excited about it. That's the exact opposite of biblical patience. Biblical patience is full. It's zealous. It's alive. It's miraculous. It's like it will change everything about the way you see your life. Now, in prayer meetings for, I'd say, about the last year, this theme has come up on Tuesdays and sometimes Thursday mornings where the Lord is like, if you could just see eternity, you could see these days never end. Like the day that you're like kind of plowing through today, you know, mucking through today. If you could just see, these days never end. You've got billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of them. Then you can bring it all back to today and be like, okay, today is a day to get free of the stuff that keeps me trapped. But if you're impatient, if you're like, I just got to get to that day when I'm free, you never will. You're free today. If you hear the word of the Lord today, enter into the rest today. You got a time problem. I have a time problem. The whole earth has a time problem. And I want to tell you, right now, the body of Christ is shifting all over the earth right right now. And many people are like, it's on. He's coming. I believe it. I don't care if I see it or not. It can't continue like this. That's good. You don't want to miss it. You don't want to be like, well, when I see this, then I'll believe it. If you're like that, you're like the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were never given that. Actually, God was like, I'm going to see to it you don't get that. I'm going to see to it you don't see that sign. The only sign you're going to see is the sign of the son of Jonah. Of the sign of Jonah. That's it. And I could do a whole other message on the sign of Jonah. Okay, so connection to God in faith in the context of urgency determines our righteousness, nothing else. The wise and foolish bridesmaids and all the parables of Matthew 25 are related to this difference of time. So when you read Matthew 24, it says the... Wise servant gives his other servants the right food at the, at the right time. The evil servant says, my master's delaying is coming. The, you know, the, the, hypocr- the reward of the hypocrites. Then in Matthew 25, it says, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. And it gives them the parable of the ten bridesmaids, the parable of the minas or the, the, the talents, and then the parable of the goats and the sheep, which isn't really a parable. It's a teaching about the goats and the sheep. So you have to understand this time really matters. All of the righteousness, all of the first resurrection hinder, hinges on time, okay? That's kind of the point of me saying all this. So, and the reason that I'm saying it today is that the book of Ephesians is mostly talking about this time, that in the fullness of this time, Jesus is gathering together in the heavens and the earth everything in him. So is that the way that you're framing your trouble Monday, like tomorrow? Is that the way you're going to frame your trouble tomorrow? Is that the way you framed your trouble last Monday? Is that the way you framed your trouble last Tuesday? Or was your trouble actually, somebody's resisting me, trying to make my time here less than it could be? That's the road to hell. That's the road to hell. But if you're like, oh, this trouble, it just tells me, oh, I could redeem this time. These days are evil. Like, I could live fully in freedom today. If you did that, where where would you hang out? I'm sorry? In the prayer room. Even more so, you'd come to the prayer room and hang out in heaven. That's the only way you can do what I'm saying. If you grit your teeth and try to make today great, you're delusional. It's not great. It's actually evil. That's what it's saying. These days are evil. Redeem the time. Redeem it how? Go up to heaven. Look at how Jesus treats people. Look at how he forgives his enemies. Be unwilling to let another day. It says, don't let the, the sun go down on your wrath, right? That's what it says in the Bible. It says you actually have to get clean today, clear today. You don't know. See the time right. So at harvest time, Wheat manifests the fruit of the Spirit. Now, harvest time, everything changes. Everything's different. It's darker. Anybody think it's darker right now? Does the sun and the moon look a little bit different right now? Do people look different right now? Do cities look different right now? Totally different. I just, I wrote a little song called Look Up, and I'm like, can I find a picture of a city that's like full of smoke? Yes. 
like a million pictures of cities full of smoke and not the same city. All over the earth, cities are hazy with smoke. It's harvest time right now. The light's different. The sun's growing dark. The moon's growing, the moon's growing dim. The sun's growing dim. The moon's growing dark. People's hearts are failing them right now. Your hearts are failing you right now. That's good. Your heart was never going to make it to heaven on its own anyway. <laughs> you want to know now. To shock me now is the way Mike Bickle would say, right? Shock me now. Don't shock me later. Your heart's failing right now. Great. Bumpy spot. Great. Reach in. Take hold of who? Jesus. Where is Jesus right now? Here in this room. The body of Jesus is right here. The head is there. The head is actually taking hold of us. So if we're doing what the head is doing, we're taking hold of us too. Do you get what I'm saying? Now is the time. Now is the time. I really believe he's coming in 2024. And in 2024, if I'm standing here in August of 2024, I'm going to be like, I really believe he's coming in whatever it is the next thing that he shows me to believe. But I'm going to believe it. It's changed my life. I love it. I think it's wonderful. I think that for 11 years, 12 years now, I've been telling people, I think this is it. Don't believe me. Ask him. I'm clean. He loves me. I enjoy him. He enjoys me. It's changed me. It's changed the way I deal with people. It's changed the way I walk into rooms. It's changed the way I'm willing to spend my life or my career or my money. I love believing now is the time. I want to believe it more, not less. Do you? Do you? Or do you want proof? Do you want to see your five things that you were waiting for happen? Or are you kind of like, I don't know, maybe this isn't it. If you're, I don't know, maybe this isn't it. You just took a step into the darkness, into the death, into the rebellion, into hating Jesus' friends. According to Jesus, I don't want to do that. I do do that. But he tells me, he's so faithful to say, Tom, does it matter? Isn't the right thing to do always the right thing to do? Isn't it always the right thing to do? Okay, so at harvest time, wheat manifests the fruit of the Spirit. That's what I'm describing to you. Tares manifest the works of the flesh, which is harlotry, foolishness, confusion, lack of endurance. They're just like, I don't know if I can make it anymore. If you're saying that, that makes you human. That's okay. But you have to get a different confession. You have to get a confession that says, yes, this is the time. Of course it's like this. This is what he told me. He said that he told me all these things so I wouldn't stumble is the way he says it in John 16. Now, both are determined. Tares and wheat are determined by love. And different works are evil and rejected. So you could be like, well, I'm still doing the stuff. I'm still doing the things. I'm showing up. Just a little colder, a little bit harder, a little bit. Into, I don't know. Maybe this isn't it. This, is, this protects my heart. I don't want to get too excited and then get disappointed. Is Jesus going to disappoint you? Nope. Are you going to disappoint him? Maybe. Maybe. And it all has to do with faith. It has to do with your confession. It has to do with the way you carry your heart. Not the way anybody else carries their heart. Everybody else, the way they carry their heart is the context for you to learn love. The way everyone else carries their heart is the context for you to learn love. If everybody carried their heart in love and you didn't, that'd be really bad. And I want to tell you, there's some people carrying their heart in love around us right now. And we're actually called up to them. And of all these witnesses, Jesus lives inside of us, and he carries his heart in love all the time. So we're supposed to be actually asking, my friend Jesus, how do I deal with you? And he's like, love me. Forgive me. If you give me a cup of cold water, I'll reward you forever. If you visit me in prison when I'm sick, right? This is what he says in Matthew 25. Do you see it this way? Do you see the hurting, broken people around you this way? No. I mean, if you're honest, no. And we have to actually say, I, could, I should actually be more free. I could be less worried about tomorrow. I could be less caught up in what's happening to me here, more with you, but more engaged here, more engaged here. That's how you know. It's by your level of engagement free from what everybody else is pinned down by, okay? It's called the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, so both are determined by love. Indifferent works are evil and rejected. What, and what is meant by Jesus in referring to tares? Okay, indifferent works are evil and rejected. That's what he's talking about with tares. It's not a lack of works. It's a lack of fruit. They look like wheat, but all they do is to be seen as righteous. That's what he said to the Pharisees. He says, you make your phylacteries broad. You love to pray in the public places. You love to be heard as somebody righteous. But you won't go in and you won't let anybody else go in. You're a whitewashed tomb. 
They don't endure the testing of faith. Self-effort and self-assurance to be righteous that you, or self-effort or self-assurance, I call them the same thing, to be righteous that you are righteous will pit you against the righteous and you won't know it. Okay, I'm going to say that one more time because I don't even understand my own text or my own context, syntax. Your self-effort that you're righteous, it will pit you against the actual righteous. That's probably the best way to say it. And you won't know it. That's the scariest part about it. You won't know it because you'll be thinking, I'm doing all these righteous acts. Have you ever thought that? You ever thought, I'm in it. I'm staying in it. I'm forgiving the person. No, you're not. Because if you were, you'd be like Jesus, ready for another round together. Yeah, it's okay. Take your time. Take your time. I get it. It's hard. Take your time. Do you see what I'm saying? This kind of oil that God pours out on that Psalm 133 unity, this makes everything work. But if we just close the heavens and we grit our teeth, this is what he's saying to Ephesus in Revelation 2. You're doing all this stuff. It's not going to work. You're going to burn the engine out. It's the gears are grinding. We actually have to be a people that forget. Sign up for another round. Okay, let's do this. Let's keep going, right? So, you, And if you don't, what happens is it pits you against the righteous, and you don't even know it because you think, I'm doing my best, and your best is, it was never going to get you into heaven. Luke 18, 9 to 14. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The other, clearly, everybody knew they were wrong. Everybody knew the tax collector was bad. And the Pharisee could have like, called his friends and been like, you guys agree, right? The tax collector stinks. And they'd be like, yeah, the tax collector stinks. Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I mean, they really didn't like tax collectors. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, isn't it funny that the tax collector, we see stories in the Bible of the tax collector inviting Jesus to parties. We really don't see the Pharisees inviting Jesus to parties. Now, in the flesh, you see the time different than those you look down on. And when I say look down on, I mean those you're concerned about. So I think... uh, Barbara said it at the beginning. I just want everybody else to get it. I want everybody else to know what I know. That's actually to look down on people. Whether we might not realize it, but that is like, oh man, they all have to know what I know. That puts you above somebody else, and you're saying, I'm the standard of knowing. Well, I'm not. You're not. No, we actually have to get into this other place, okay? You see the time different than those you look down on. You also see the time differently than those that are extravagantly giving their lives to Jesus with no apparent concern for this life at all. You feel judged by them. You see somebody just burning every bridge, going hard after Jesus. This is the time. It's very tempting to feel judged by somebody like that. I had somebody change my life radically just because they were like that. And I don't even really stay in contact with that person anymore, but they will have ever marked my life just because they were radically going after Jesus. So it's easy to judge that, right, and miss that I'm judging this. It's it's just we all see time differently is kind of the point. Because I'm going to say this one more time because I feel like I'm getting confused in my own expression of this, but I know what I want to convey. Okay, so you see the time different than those you look down on or are concerned about. So I may be tempted to look at my kids and be like, I see see Jesus' return is so near, and so I'm doing this with my life, and I wish they would too. That's the flesh. But I also see somebody else that I think is doing more And I'm like, I feel judged by this. I don't know. Is that right? And that person can look down on me and be like, I really wish they would get what I get. And they're also looking at someone. They're like, I'm at my, that's all the flesh. That's got nothing to do with righteousness and truth, okay? So in the heavens, that's the flesh. In the heavens, you see time like Jesus does. This produces patience, urgency without eyesight, and faith, which is action due to confidence. It's got nothing to do with what anybody else thinks. I don't know how my kids see time. I can't get inside of Noah's head. He does some things more zealously than I do. But he does some things that I'd be like, if I were him seeing the time that I see, I would. That is acting like God. I don't know. I'm just using Noah as an example. But I'm always free to see how Jesus sees the time. 
I'm always free to see. I could actually believe that with him and act like him in it. And, you know, believe it or not, there's like 584 passages in this book about time in the New King James. 584 passages about time. How much are you trying to see time like Jesus does? Or how much are you trying to see time like the people around you do? Or wishing they saw the time like you did and missing the time? Do you see what I'm saying? It's all about love. It can only come from the, the spirit response to the way you see time. It can't come from evaluating whether or not my kids are getting ready for this thing. That's external. It can't come from feeling judged because somebody else is doing this and wondering, is it really that close? That's external. The only internal thing that will produce love is, Jesus, what time is it? Are you coming? Not, I'm going to do this if you're coming soon. It's, do I have time to do this today? Do I have time to get it? That's patience. If you see the next trillion years this way, you're not running out of time for anything. But you're not wasting any time today. You're not running out of time for anything. You don't have to worry. Are we going to all get, are we going to be pure and spotless before Jesus comes? I hope so. But it's going to be in this context. You're going to be as pure and as spotless as you can be today with him if you decide this is the way you want to live your life. And then every day after that. Or you're going to be impatient and you're going to be doubting that he could do it. And you're going to be scrambling around trying to make sure everybody else sees it the way that you do. So you can all go in together and that's impatience and doubt. Do you see what I'm saying? So we really have to get to, I've been given this day, I've been given Sunday, August 6th, to really self-evaluate with the Lord. Lord, what do I believe about the time? Do I believe what you believe about the time? Am I redeeming this day because the days are evil? Or am I just doubting that there's enough time to do all this stuff? Are you guys with me? Okay. So this patience and faith makes you safe. The patience and faith I'm describing. I'm going to take about eight more minutes, okay? Item two, you must be reborn. You redeem the time by seeing your practical life being lived in eternity in the momentary light affliction of now. You mostly were born seeing the momentary light affliction of eternity and trying to get everything right in your practical life right now. That's impractical. That's ridiculous. You actually have to reverse it, okay? So Romans 8, 14 to 23. This is the way Paul carried his heart. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. As many as are like, okay, my thoughts, they don't, they're not fully informed. My emotions, they're based on something flimsy that doesn't stand up to the test of time. My will is radically in the wrong direction. I'm going to be led by the Spirit. I'm going to actually let God tell me what to think, how to feel, and what to do. So as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, for sure, predestined. If you're a child, you are predestined to be an heir. But the question is, are you his child? Are you actually his kid? Is he all your strength? Is he all your wealth? Is he all your plan, all your emotions, all your thoughts? Are you his kid? The answer is not yet, right? But you're being reborn. Okay, that's the point. The Spirit died. By the, the Spirit himself uh, bears witness uh, with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, whatever your suffering is this week, it's not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. Whatever you think is the problem this week, it's nothing. It's literally nothing compared to the glory that he's revealing in us if you are willing to be his kid. If you're willing to see dad in all this. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. So if we really believe this passage, we believe our lives here are futile. Futile. Your life here is futile. Without, without you actually seeing all this is about me being reborn into a different place, into a different atmosphere, learning how to breathe a different air, learning how to think different thoughts, learning how to see time through eternity, not in my 70 or 80 years, you're wasting your time. You can flip all the Bible verses on it you want. You're wasting your time. It's futile. It's vanity. It's chasing the wind is the way Solomon said it. It's, it's worth nothing. You have to actually come out and say, the whole point of my life is actually to see I'm being born again. Like, I'm getting 
lungs to breathe faith in heaven. I'm getting eyes to see. That's what Paul's praying for. He's like, since I heard of your faith, I don't stop praying that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you would have wisdom and revelation to know the glory of his inheritance in you, in you. This is what it's all about. This is the only point. But now if you do this, if you really risk it all on this, and I have yet to do it, but I've heard rumor, you will find a more full life here. You will be light on earth. You will be safe. You've always been safe. You're being born again. That means you're in the womb of the Father. That means that it's dark around you, but you can hear his heartbeat. He's feeding you the faith you need, the hope you need, the love you need, and you're getting ready to live. We haven't even tasted it yet. We haven't even gotten there yet. And so we kick against the womb. We get frustrated. We get tangled up in our own umbilical cord. But we have to have confidence. We're safe. We've always been safe. We're predestined to safety if we will let him be our dad, if we will be his kids, if we will just say, my only job is to give this man my heart. My only job in life is to give Yeshua my heart. That's it. And if I give it to him, he'll give it back to me so much more than I could imagine. He will give me all the power to do, all the grace to live a life of good works if I will just give him my heart. And the way I know is by my love, not just for Jesus. He says, if you say you love God, but you don't love the people God brought you with, you're a liar. The truth is not in you. For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. That eagerly waiting is called patience. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Impatience is a flesh thing. It's wanting things to change materially around you and waiting, holding your breath until they change. Patience is a Holy Spirit thing. It happens in the heavens. It's eagerly waiting in the heavens. You see what I'm saying? Way different. And your flesh will interpret it totally wrong. Your flesh will interpret it, be chill here on earth. Heaven will take care of itself. That's impatience. So you must be reborn again to see the kingdom. Rebirth is a process. Birth in the natural takes about nine months. Spiritual rebirth takes this life. To see heaven, you must be born again, John 3. To live there, you have to grow there. Think on it. Store treasure there. Dwell there. You have to learn to breathe, think, govern. That means parent, church, work, spouse, invest your money, die to yourself. You have to govern there, not here. You actually govern there. So if I'm preaching, believe it or not, I'm not preaching here. I'm preaching there. And when I fully get into this, it doesn't matter what here hears. When I fully get into this, it matters what there hears. And I'm in it right now, honestly. I feel really good about it right now because I know I got the word of the Lord. And so when that happens, I'm actually storing something in heaven. Part of I'm living my life there right now. This is what Paul did, okay? So um, that is David's tabernacle, what I just described to you. David's tent of praise is an expression of how David saw time. He set up a tent. He's like, I'm going to get as close as I can with what I got right now. He did something totally radically weird in Israel when he set up David's tabernacle. He knew there was going to be a temple. He, He set up a tent temporary on purpose. Do you see light hop temporary on purpose but enduring because we don't own it? This is important. This is David's, what I'm describing to you is what David did. He did. David did David's tabernacle before he ever set up a tent and put musicians in it. David was doing David's tabernacle in a duelum. He was waiting patiently to be king. He wasn't inactive. He was actually, he took 400 people that were literally a pain. And he turned them into David's mighty men. He led them in the desert in a duelum, in the cave, in the wilderness. Is that what we're doing? Or are we waiting for the situation to change so we can be the great ones that we think we're supposed to be? That's Adam and Eve. No, we have everything we need. Let's get as close as we can right now. Right now. Your willingness to get to the heart of David is being fully tested because you guys picked David's tabernacle. He told me to tell you this message. Everything in bold and underlined, he said, warn them. Encourage them. Both. It's the same thing. This is what you signed up for. Saul persecuting while David's preserve Saul's ministry and authority. Saul persecutes David. David preserves Saul's ministry and authority. 
That's what you signed up for when you said, I want to do David's tabernacle. That sounds like fun. David waiting in a duel and while knowing he should be king. Waiting. Not just waiting, actively discipling people there. David having self-control to not build the temple, but faith to erect the tabernacle. Can you do the feet washing or do you have to wash everybody's whole body? Can you just do the feet washing? Can you, what, what, you, what God told you to do today, could that be enough to be actually fully David's tabernacle? This is it? Today. It's it today. It's temporary. It's going to change. You signed up for David leaving Jerusalem when Absalom usurped him because he gave up on the place? No. Because he knew the presence of God was going to remain there. Do you know the presence of God is going to remain right here? Do you know it's going to remain here? You got to. I think there's a few places, actually, in Kalamazoo. The presence of God is going to remain. Why do I think that? Well, because Jesus told it to me in the heavens, and I believed him. I just kind of hold it in faith. He's never going to correct me for being faithful about it. He will correct me if I let it go. Don't let this place go. Just don't hold it in the flesh, okay? Mourning Absalom. You signed up to mourn Absalom. When, and when Absalom tried to take the throne from David, and then David and his guys, they went and actually found themselves in a battle with Absalom. David was like, don't hurt Absalom. And his guys were like, what? Why was David saying that? Because he lived in a place Joab could not live. He was living in the heavenly realm. It made no sense to David's men that David would care that Absalom's life be preserved. And when Absalom died, David disrupted the entire nation by mourning it. They're like, this is a day of victory, David. And David's like, I'm living somewhere way different than you are. I'm saying this, this is all temporary. This is all a tent. David would be like, my entire life is a tabernacle. It's all a tent. I'm living here right now. People that live here, they don't make sense to people that live here. People that live here do things that don't make any sense to people that live here. They carry a heart standard, a heart value that people here can't understand, but people here can come up. They can come up. You signed up for McCall hating David's zeal. That's what you signed up for when you signed up for David's tabernacle. Michael hating David's zeal. You signed up for Joab, your right-hand guy, doing his own thing in the name of you. That's what Joab did to David. David was like, Joab, please do this. Joab was like, yeah, 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 I'm going to do this. I'm helping you, David. That's what you signed up for when you signed up for David's heart. That's what you signed up for when you signed up for David's tabernacle. That's what Jesus, did Jesus sign up for this? Did Judas represent Yeshua well? Why did Yeshua give Judas the money box? Why did Yeshua make Judas an apostle or a, a disciple? It's the heart of David. It's the heart of David. This is, this is the man we're supposed to be a part of his body. Do you see what I'm saying? You are a part of his body. You're just, you're being formed right now. So don't get discouraged when I'm saying things. You're like, oh man, I didn't know I signed up for that. I didn't even know I, I don't know I have to be that way and I don't want to be that way. Don't be discouraged. Just be willing to grow. Be willing to say, okay, God, my whole life, the, the, part, the important part of my entire existence, my, the important part of tomorrow, Monday, the important part of Sunday afternoon is that I get ready to meet you, God. Because you're coming. You're coming so soon. David continually running out of his shame and into God when he was found in deep sin. That's what you signed up for. You didn't sign up for, I'm going to put myself on probation. I'm going to give myself a little time out until I get it together. You signed up for, I sinned against you, God, even though you sinned against a ton of other people. I sinned against you, and I want you to make me clean. I'm running into you right now, and I'm going to get back into an open, unguarded heart and full of zeal for what is happening all around me. This is a tent. If you want that, stand up with me. If you really connect with this, it doesn't make this life less important. It puts it under God's feet. This life is so important. God doesn't waste anything. He says it works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. What I'm describing to you is prioritizing a reality that will free us. If you want that, let's just raise our hands before him. Holy Spirit in this room, he says, I I just sowed some seeds. He says there's different soil here, all kinds of different soil. He said some are going to grow things differently than others are going to grow things. God, I just want to receive the seed you sowed to me. I'm asking right now, Holy Spirit, would you send water in this place? Would you send fire, the light, the light of your glory? 
Would you cause something to grow? God, would you help us to live in the heavenly realm? God, where the enemy says that that's irresponsible, that we'd see he's a liar. God, where history has told me that if I don't do something, everything's not going to work out, I just break off that assignment right now in Jesus' name. History doesn't know the future. Only you know the future, God. So I'm asking, as we change, he says, everybody here is changing. You, you're, you're basing your judgment on what's happening based on who people were yesterday or even a week ago or even 10 years ago or five years ago. He's like, people are changing just like you're changing. Change with me. Grow with me. Just grow with me. Holy Spirit in this room. Just release confidence that we're going to grow into something beautiful. We're going to grow into something beautiful. We repent, Lord. We repent. Let your beauty come. Let your beauty come into this room. Let us do David's tabernacle. Let us not waste any of the days this week where we have prayer meetings. And let us know it's temporary. Both. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 18, verse 19. 